Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 240, an interview with Dr. Jonathan Fenno about his new book, Fighting the People's War, The British and Commonwealth Armies and the Second World War. Following up from his previous book, Combat and Morale in the North African Campaign, The Eighth Army and the Path to El Alamein, Dr. Fenno zooms out and gives us the whole of World War II from the British and Commonwealth perspective. Dr. Jonathan Fennell is a senior lecturer in defense studies at King's College, London. He is also the co-director of the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War, chair of the Defense Studies Department, MA Assessment Subboard, co-founder and co-director of the Second World War Research Group, and a member of the War Studies Research Ethics Panel. So, Dr. Fennell, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. If I had to give initial response to reading your book, it would probably be something like, one does not simply read a Dr. Fennell book, one rereads it. That's because there was so much information packed in there. It was so comprehensive. Um, and of course, it's you know just over 700 pages as far as the actual text. I have to ask, how long did it take you to research and then write this book? <laughs> too long i think my <laughs> publisher might say um it took about three years um traveling around the world um getting into archives to get the basic data and information that underpinned the arguments in the book and then it took me about another three years truth be told to to write it so it's 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 taken up a huge part of my life for a long time um <laughs> I've had two little kiddies born in that time. Wow. Um, and it's kind of accompanied me on this journey. Um, so it's a labor of love in many ways. Right. Um, but it's also, you know, it's such a privilege to to be allowed to be, you know, to make a living out of thinking and researching and engaging with kind of big ideas and big questions such as, you know, the Second World War, how does war lead to social change? What kind of impacts on geopolitics did the war have? You know, empires, the destruction of, the rise of the great American super state um, and superpower. Um, so, yeah, it's been a privilege. I've loved it. Yeah, I, I, you could probably think of this book as another child to add to your family. But I do love the fact that you added, you included all of the reports that you used in the back of the book for someone, you know, who really wants to get stuck into World War II, the details, that's all there in, in, included in that. I enjoyed that very much. Um, so if I could, um, I watched you on a lecture on YouTube. And in that lecture, you quoted a Sir Michael Howard when he said, wars are not tactical exercises at large. They are conflicts of society. They can only be fully understood only if one understands the nature of the society fighting them. And after reading your book, I got the sense that you took that premise and went with it, but in a much larger way. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's it's central to understanding the approach to the book. Um, but it's only in many ways half the book. So half the book is dealing with this big debate over whether the British and Commonwealth armies performed very well or not. It's telling the story of how they got on. Um, but it's deeply connected to what's going on on the home front. And the argument goes, that how can you understand the behavior of men and women in combat if you don't know um, what's happening in their homes? Mm -hmm. Because that's 
that's you know that's the thing that drives especially you know young men most combatants and almost all combatants at this stage were young men young men are thinking first and foremost of their loved ones back home and um, so when we try to get to grips with their behavior on a battlefield i think we need to know what is going on at home socially politically economically right so this book's goal seems to be in a single volume, a comprehensive history of the British and Commonwealth armies in World War II, which is staggering enough. But like you were saying a minute ago, you cover so much more than that. Can you tell us about um, the, one of the central themes of this, which is the morale effect and how that morale can fluctuate through a very long war? Yeah, I mean, so if, if Howard's insight kind of helps understand one half of the book. The other half of the book is about how the experience of fighting uh, influences the political views of combatants. Mm. And so how those soldiers went back to their societies and voted in key elections, how they changed the world around them. So there's kind of this, this, this two-way street. The home influence the front, the home front influence the battlefront. And then by understanding dynamics on the battlefront, we get a much clearer idea of how change happens on the home front over time. Yeah, I, I'll have to say that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about your book is just the multi-layer. It's almost like a spider web. One side affects the other side, that affects the home front, that affects the officers, and the officers are constantly checking out the, the morale of the men through their letters, and there's the censoring aspect of it. You just really get a sense that this was much more complicated than than what we're normally told. You know, it's just war where officers give orders and the men go out and do it. But this really does show it was a very human affair. And I, and that was just one of the, which might sound obvious in hindsight, but it was one of the things that I really enjoyed about your book. So in your introduction, well, yep, sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the point you make, I think is, is an important one. It, the story we're used to hearing is the story told us by Churchill mm -hmm. or the story told us by Montgomery or Slim, you know, the great men who, you know, when you listen to their own accounts, were obviously central to the way they understood the war. Right. But when you start to, you know, really get deep into it, the kind of shocking, I mean, as you point out, maybe it shouldn't be shocking. Obviously, it shouldn't be shocking. <laughs> Ordinary people mattered. Yes. Um, you know, a young guy in a slit trench somewhere in a field in France has the fate of the nation, you know, on his shoulders. If he decides to run away, mm -hmm. you know, democracy dies. If he holds his ground and fights and you know repels the attackers democracy lives the nation survives um, and in some ways that's a really exciting story you know all of us have this power to affect um, our reality our world and in some ways it's terrifying right that we all have that responsibility on our shoulders that so you know strategy mm -hmm. you know these the, the fate of nations is a complex thing everybody plays a role and we need to integrate the ordinary person more effectively into that story. And that's why I think, you know, you touched on these sources, these censorship summaries. That's why I think they're so important. Um, so let's say, you know, your normal book, um, it, you know, having a look at British and Commonwealth or any army in the Second World War or any war, it might be based on, you know, 100 letters, 100, you know, memoirs or looking right. at the experience of 100 troops. Maybe if you're really hardworking, 1,000. But well, these censorship summaries, so you know, soldiers are writing home, their letters are censored and turned into weekly, bi-weekly and monthly morale reports. These reports I found were based on something like 17 million letters. <laughs> so we're getting, you know, we're getting 17 million perspectives right. rather than maybe a couple of hundred or a thousand. And so that allows the story to be told with authority, with confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we get it. And what's remarkable, I think, is the story is different. It is not the Churchillian narrative. It is a very different one. The ordinary person experienced the war in a very different way. Um, that's exciting, I think. A absolutely, because for people out there like me who are, um, and maybe something's wrong with me, I don't know, but I'm obsessed about World War II ever since I was 12 years old. But if you're just a person who likes to read history books, it's not your job, it's your hobby. But if you read about great men, you've got Alexander, you've got Caesar, you've got uh, Churchill, and you've got um, Stalin, things like that. Yeah, you do end up getting a sense that they're controlling so much more. And in some ways, it's all about them. And that's one of the things I appreciated about your book is that it turned that very idea of the great man 
on its head because the great men not only have to direct the war, but they also have to react to the morale of their men because you can come up with all the plans you want, but if your if your men's morale is in the gutter, they're not going to be very effective and you have to address those issues. I mean, spot on. I mean, I mean, you don't only have to look at the world around us right now. To what extent are our leaders really in control? You don't get the impression that they're that much in control, do you? I mean, listen, I can't control my two kids at home. I mean, let alone how you, you know, how you run a, right. a country, you know, in a world war. I mean, so strategy, if you know, if that is the process of you know trying to get from A to B to win a war, it's iterative. You know, it, it's it's a process. Um, it's multi layered. So it's happening, yes, in an office in Whitehall or in Washington, um, but it's also happening much lower down the kind of the chain. So, you know, young fellas, um, in this case, you know, as I say, in a slit trench, you know, the strategic corporal narrative, they can influence the outcome of events. And the decisions that those people are making, as you quite rightly point out, filter back up through the chain, you know, the levels of war and influence what's happening in Washington and London. Mm. So we have to understand it as a system of systems, <laughs> um, which is complex, but also really exciting because you know, the world is not binary. It's not made up of ones and zeros. Human beings are infinitely complex. And when we start to look at the world, I think, in that way, we get, a, I think, a more accurate picture of how change happens. Absolutely. And if I could stick with that theme, uh, in your introduction, you say that the men fighting – were doing so not only to defeat the Axis powers, but they were also hoping or thinking about improving the modern nation. And I was surprised, and, and maybe I shouldn't have been, that they had such weighty topics on their minds during all those long months and years of warfare. I mean, they were actually quite, like you were saying, quite concerned about their families and also what's going on back at home. This is one of the things that surprised me most when I got to grips with these censorship summaries. Because the you know the literature mostly suggests that the English speaking armies didn't care at all about politics. Um, you know, it's about the primary group, the comradeship, the band of brothers narrative. Yeah. They fought for each other, and all this political stuff didn't matter. Um, and it's so dominant. Um, and yet here we have the soldiers' letters, and they're just talking about politics all the time, all the time. Right. They really care. And there's a frustration over what had happened post-1918. You know, the, the homes fit for heroes never materialized. The depression had been rough. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, listen, okay, you may have got our fathers to sacrifice themselves for the state uh -huh. and offer little in return. You're not going to get away with it again. There has to be a bit of quid pro quo here. We will fight. We will fight with great energy if you give us something in return. And that thing has to be a better post-war state. Uh, in the case of Britain in particular, it hinges around the Beveridge Report, this report that comes out in late 1942, setting out the blueprint for a welfare state, you know, national health. Um, and, and the soldiers want it. That's the thing they want. They want a better post-war world, a new Jerusalem, as some have referred, referred to it as. Yeah, I, I just have to ask, when it comes to that report, I mean, it's in the middle of the war. It is. Is that a response to what the troops were kind of asking for, or was this kind of leading the way? I, I, if you could just tell us more about that, because I, I do know it seems to be, look, we're in the middle of a war fighting for our survival, and you're talking about the future. That's if we have one, if we win this war. It doesn't seem like it should be a priority, but it turns out to be massively important to the troops. Yeah, I mean that's. I mean Churchill's perspective is very is 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 that in in a nutshell, right? So the report mm -hmm. kind of it, it is it is constructed in a way to give a a blueprint for what the whole nation is fighting for, not just the soldiers, the whole nation. And mm -hmm. um, so something positive to work towards. And you know Churchill, you know, was a man of great vision. That no one can deny that right. he was moved by the plight of the poor. He was not of the poor, as we. <laughs> As we, as we well know. Right. Um, and his, his reaction to it was, you know, well and good, we can't deal with that now. We are in the midst of a crisis of, you know, quite literally of global proportions. Mm -hmm. um, the fate of the state is um, in the balance. We can't talk about post-war. We can make promises that we can't be sure to keep. Which, you know, you could say, well, that's a reasonable perspective, right. um, considering. The problem is, you can't get to that place. You can't get to victory unless you bring the people with you, um, unless you mobilize the people for this great sacrifice. Mm. And the people say, well, you know what? I want a promise now. Um, give me that promise 
and we will mobilize for the state and we will win this thing. Um, and so there's this kind of disconnect between Churchill or the state and the ordinary soldier. And um, the promise isn't made. The, the, the conservatives who are, you know, the dominant partner in the wartime coalition with Labour basically shelve beverage um, and keep it on a, keep it on a long arm. Mm. Um, and this is this is a disaster for the troops who feel very much let down. All right. And, and not to jump ahead too much, it might be a disaster mm. for the troops, but it's also going to be a, a disaster for the conservatives by the end of the war because people who are a little more politically savvy, maybe than their fathers, they're going to figure out, look, we know what you're trying to do. And like you were saying earlier, we're not going to make the, all these sacrifices for a pittance of what we should be getting for all of our sacrifices. Quite right. And what happens in 1945? There's a general election. Churchill and the Conservatives get booted out in this landslide victory for Labour. And I think we'll talk about it a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. The evidence is, I think, overwhelming that the soldiers voted um, for Labour and that, you know, the soldier and, and his... His social network, his family and friends were absolutely essential to the numbers to the outcome of that election. Right. If we could stick for if we could stick with politics for a moment, but kind of zoom out. Sure. Um, until yeah. I read your book, I don't think I appreciated, and I'm not sure what word to use, how tepid in some ways the various parts of the empire joined in when London declared war on Germany. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, I was I was a bit surprised by this as well. I mean. Yeah, I think every nation and state wants to put their hands up and say they were first uh, in the line to tackle mm -hmm. Nazi Germany. Um, when I started looking at the mobilization statistics, however, um, you know, who actually fought? Where did they come from? Um, what was their social class? It became quite evident that those who felt a strong relationship with Britain or the state were more likely to sign up to fight um, than those that did not. Mm -hmm. And if we look back at the empire, you know, in the late 1930s, early 1940s, it was a complex mix of state systems. There were French-speaking Canadians who had no love of Britain and English-speaking Canadians who did. There were Afrikaans-speaking South Africans who had no love at all for Britain and there were English-speaking South Africans who did. So, you know, rates of mobilization, those who show up uh, is m are much, much higher amongst, say, English-speaking South Africans and English-speaking Canadians than they are amongst French-speaking Canadians and, you know, uh, Afrikaans-speaking South Africans. Um, understandably enough, mobilization in India is, you know, really not that impressive. I mean, the narrative goes the biggest volunteer army in history was created out of the subcontinent in the Second World War, you know, over two million people, which wow. is, on the surface, very impressive. Mm -hmm. But out of, you know, 350 million people, that is only a tiny amount of the potential manpower of India at the time. So those parts of the empire that didn't feel a great connection with Britain were less likely to to sign up. And in those places where you've got really kind of detailed statistics um, that have survived, such as New Zealand, you see that 47% of all those called up during the war appealed against their call up, said, you know, I prefer not to go. Right. And formally asked to go. Um, and the New Zealand case is, is, I think, fairly representative. It's just we, we know it happened in New Zealand because they kept the statistics in other places. Um, statistics just aren't there to support, aren't there to show what happened. So I guess ordinary people were more interested in their own personal universe than in geopolitics, which, again, <laughs> you know, when you say it out loud, shouldn't be much of a surprise. Right. Um, I, I, if I could follow up real quick, and I'm and I'm going off memory here, so you're probably going to have to correct me. But in the introduction of your book, there's a quote from, and I'm not sure of his proper title. It's like the minister to India. He was he was making a reference to India. I mean, India was like you were saying, the ones that are politically aware, or they're like, okay, we get that you need us, but we want something out of this. I mean, we want to talk about independence. We want to have this conversation. We want either a date or a range of dates set. I mean. London had to, I mean, th this was a, a serious challenge to the British control over India j in some ways just to get the Indians to come in. And like you said, they contributed massively to the a um, Allies' um, effort. I mean, it's an interesting moment, isn't it, for the, for the British Empire. And for the second time in a generation, it relies on the subject peoples of the empire to, to sacrifice for the existence of that empire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it hasn't exactly been great if you're a, an Indian peasant for a long time. And they say, well, OK, I mean, or say Congress, you know, their representatives and mm -hmm. um, the Indian National Cong Congress says, 
okay, we'll we'll step up, but you have to give us something in return. Very similar to the narrative, right, to the debate that's going on in the home front in Britain. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want us to fight, there has to be a bit of payback. So, so this kind of these cri- these moments of crisis. The war is an opportunity to negotiate the relationship mm-hmm. between the citizen and the state. There's got to be a little bit of give and take. Um, so the the outcome is basically Britain gives away India in. Uh, in response to its need right. to for, from Indian manpower and material in the Second World War, um, so it's a it's a it's it's the nail in the coffin of the British Empire. Right. And if we could stay with that theme, but go back to New Zealand for a second, could you tell us? And I, mm-hmm. I, and I know this comes later, but if you could tell us about the the furlough mutiny. And again, New Zealand was you know their morale, the morale of the government, the people and the troops. This is a major factor in them contributing to the war. Yeah, I mean, so this dynamic between home and front is really brought to the fore by the experience um, of the New Zealanders in the war. And it's it's easier to tell their story in many ways, again, because the sources have been kept in, in a way that they've been destroyed in other archives. Mm. So, in you know, by the end of 1942, um, you know, early 1943, um, the New Zealand expeditionary force in the Mediterranean is just knackered. It's exhausted. It's been fighting solidly for, you know, the best part of a couple of years. And the offer is made to send about 6,000 troops home to New Zealand on furlough, on leave, to kind of recharge the batteries. The idea being, once they recharge the batteries, they can come back to the front and get on with the job. So these guys are sent home. They're, needless to say, delighted. Um, they return home, and what they find is a is a country that they perceive not really to be playing its full role in the war. People are living a good life. The war isn't impinging massively on their quality of day-to-day life. Mm-hmm. And there are, this is the real problem, 35,000 fully fit young men working in essential industry, you know, in industry, right. um, and not fighting. So they say, well, hold on, this can't be right. You're right. going to send me back to the front. I've already fought once, and you're going to send me back to fight a second time when there are perfectly fit young men here who could fight for a first time. So mm-hmm. no man twice before every man once became the kind of the battle cry of the, of the furlough men. Well, the long and short of it is most of them refused to go back, wow. um, simply refused. And they, it, 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 it's a mutiny, I think, in, in, any, in any way that I understand what a mutiny is. I mean, I know it's harsh. Um, they refused to go back. And this has big consequences for those still serving um, in Italy in and around the time of the casino battles, which I assume you know, most listeners will have perhaps heard of you know, these big, big right. battles in, in Italy in 1944. Um, so if you imagine, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a New Zealander now in pretty cold, mountainous terrain in Italy in, you know, early 1944, and you hear what's going on back home, you know that there's these 35,000 fit men not coming out to fight, you know that those who were sent home are not coming back, which means you can't get your furlough because you're next in line, right. um, and all of a sudden you're asked to to march up a pretty, uh, pretty steep hill, take a casino town under appalling conditions. Um, and the, the impact is that there's a morale crisis, um, that there's huge rates, very high rates of sickness in the New Zealand Corps. The censorship summaries um, you know, outline this in great detail in terms of the percentage of people who are feeling you know, let down, dissatisfied, miserable, want the war to be over. Um, you know, desertion rates increase, battle exhaustion rates go through the roof. And so you know, the argument that I develop in the book is the only way we can really understand what happens at Casino, the failure of the British and Commonwealth forces to take Casino in the second and third battles, is when we look at what's happening on the home front, the furlough mutiny, and how the knowledge of the furlough mutiny is filtering through to the soldiers on the front line. And I'll just one more thing, if you if you, if you let me, now that I'm in full flow. Um, the other thing that they'd expected um, for these great offensives was that a whole pile of veteran troops would return from New Zealand. Right. Um, but when the mutiny occurs... These guys no longer um, are returning to the middle, to the Mediterranean. So you have, you know, formations going into battle without many of their key veterans. You have a lot of rookies going into battle for the first time. So performance is obviously negatively affected for that reason too. Right. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It, it comes at a critical time because we're trying to 
you know, go through Italy to try to pull um, German troops from the Atlantic Wall. So this is, like you said, it's all it's all layered, it's all tied together, and this couldn't come at a worse time. So I'm glad you mentioned that. So if we could jump into the military history of your book. Mm. Um, so if I could jump ahead a little bit, um, get to get past the crisis part of the war, but um, when it comes to the turning, some of the major turning points in the war, with North Africa lost to the Axis powers, it is time to take Italy, and as the British and Commonwealth soldiers have been fighting the longest, how does their performance stack up um, in the Italian campaign, specifically Casino, now, and now we see that they're not going to get those New Zealand reinforcements that they probably assumed they were going to get? Yeah, I mean, so we, we almost have to go right back to the start and then quickly come back to, to Italy. So mm-hmm. the way in which the British and Commonwealth armies set up to fight the Second World War is it, is not that different from the way the Germans were thinking about it. Again, that's not what the dominant kind of story in the literature. Mm-hmm. Um, they're thinking about mobile operations. They're devolving command and control to just something called mission command, which um, you know, basically means trust the, the individual closest to the enemy to make the decisions because they can see what's going on. Uh-huh. So it's a very dynamic, aggressive way of fighting. And this really doesn't work out too well in the context of the early years of the war mm-hmm. because you have you know, some of these morale problems we've just talked about and also an army that is not very well trained because the Commonwealth has mobilized very late for the war. So you're trying to convert a citizen army into an effective fighting professional force. So Montgomery rocks up in the desert in 1942. And again, that's a story that has been told. Mm. What he does, though, doctrinally, in terms of the way the army tries to fight, is really quite interesting. He just reins everything in. He says, we can't do this sophisticated type of fighting. We've got to get really conservative. We're going to use lots of artillery, you know, blast the opposition with artillery, and then advance they blast the opposition with artillery, then advance. So it's very stop-start. It's methodical. It's not particularly dynamic. Right. And that works perfectly fine, if you think about it, in a desert mm-hmm. where artillery can really dominate because there's nowhere to hide. You can, right. you, know, you can blast Rommel out of the LLA main line because there's nowhere else for him to go. Mm. Um, the problem is when you get to Sicily and you get to Italy, there are vast mountain chains. You can't dominate the battlefield with artillery in the same way. And the terrain requires dynamic, aggressive infiltration operations, the tactical and operational level. Right. And Montgomery, I mean, I suppose, you know, think you know, if you're a football coach or anything, you've just had won a couple of games, it's very hard then to change your approach, right? Because mm. you're on top for the first time. After years of defeat, he's found a way to defeat, you know, to win slowly, right. but win. And what he needs to do is change his method again, and he's reluctant to do so. And so the British and Commonwealth armies kind of plod their way up the spine of Italy in a not particularly impressive manner. I mean, it's it's rough stuff. The terrain is awful. The weather is awful. So, I mean, do they cover themselves in glory? Probably, um, probably not. It's you know, there's a lot of doughty um, you know, sticking to it, but um, it's not spectacular stuff. Right. And, and just before you go on and talk about Casino, I, that was another mm. part of your book that I enjoyed. That was that was completely new for me. So when the war starts out, the British are like, and I and I can't remember the proper terms, I apologize. Let the local commander make some decisions because they're on the scene. Montgomery con- comes in. He takes control um and it, which works fine for a while, and so then, but then that suddenly doesn't work in Italy. So this this doctrinal approach has to change. It has to ebb and flow with the changes. And because these are military men, you can see them in your book struggling with making changes. Because mm. look, this has worked mm. for the last four times. Why won't it work? Just because I'm in Italy, and you see them struggling. But at the same time, their men are dying because it's not as effective as it was in the desert. Yeah. So you know, there's no catch-all solution to the combat problem in right. the Second World War. You can't just say, "Here's a ready-made solution. Now go off and be a hero." And right. um, you know, the problem. Each problem is unique, which requires a intelligent, reflective commander to come up with a creative solution to what usually is a complex problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we get now. We've had a couple of failures at Casino, um, and there's a there's a fourth operation. So, what changes? The fourth operation leads to the liberation of Rome, which is you know the first major European capital to be freed mm-hmm. um, from you know ax- from the Axis. Um, in large part, it's it's about almost totally replacing 
Eighth Army, which is the British and Commonwealth Army that's um, fighting alongside the Americans mm -hmm. in in Italy. Bring in you bring in a lot of Poles who are much more um, inclined towards this type of aggressive operation, right? Um, and you bring in fresh units who are who who've been resting for a couple of months, who've kind of recharged their batteries, um, and you bring in the French who again. Um, are much have been trained in mountainous warfare, and so the French and the Poles, really, to a large extent, kind of unhinge the casino position, and allow the Allied breakthrough towards towards Rome. So, you know, I guess the size and the power of the empire is evident here in that they can, you know, mm -hmm. almost entirely replace the forces in contact with the enemy. Right. Um, but it is it is the ability to return some mobility to the battlefield that eventually unhinges the German um, defenses south of Rome. Yeah, I like the way you broke it down in the book. You're like, yes, they have a, the, the Allies have a lot more planes and they've got the artillery, but like the, like you said, their men are knackered. They've been going at this and they've been not doing very well, and so morale suffers. So not only are they exhausted, but they're down on themselves. You bring in a bunch of new guys and you refocus this and you bump, and you use the ability that you have with the artillery. And even then, it was a, it was a heck of a fight. But in the end, the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, was it the the Poles, the French, the New Zealand, and the and the Indian, the, I think the fourth or the mm. tenth Indian, they finally get it done. But it, but it took trial and error to go. This is a new theater. We have to fight it in a new way. The constant necessity to learn and adapt and be creative, um, and so in some ways, in you know, there's there's a really positive story for for the army or the armies here, right. in that. You know, the commanders are adapting. They are coming up with some clever – they're trying stuff all the time. Right. Um, but they face some just really, really difficult challenges. Okay, sure, the terrain in Italy, you know, as far as terrain favors one side or another, it, it probably defenders, favors the defenders. And there are kind of socio-political issues. We've talked about mm -hmm. the furlough mutiny. We've talked about how the unwillingness of the British government to kind of row in behind beverage – um, impacted on British morale. Um, so you've got these kind of systemic problems dragging at the army, and then you've got a, a series of commanders and a war office that's trying to find a way to compensate for them and, and produce positive outcomes on the battlefield. So it's, it's a real challenge. Right. Um, and I suppose that they, they, that they got anywhere is, is, is pretty impressive in many ways. Yeah, but for me, for me, what made it really, and this is in a morbid kind of way, what made this part of your book enjoyable for me is that you add the element of the drama that it's, there's a timetable. They're trying to get ready for D-Day, which we'll go into a moment, but there's a countdown. Mm. They have to get the landing craft back up um, to the channel to get it ready. So even though they're trying all these things, there there are time limits. There are logistical limits. And, you know, some of the commanders are, aren't as aggressive as others are, but eventually, like you said, they crack mm -hmm. Casino and, and Rome is liberated. If we could take the idea of adaptive, uh, doctrinal approaches and shifted to the Eastern theater for a second. Um, mm. Of course, when the Japanese, you know, they launch their attack at Pearl Harbor and they're all ready to go. So they have a lot of success in the East in late 41 and 42. So clearly the troops that are going to have to oppose them, the Indians, the Australians and other forces um, that are going to oppose them, they have to really rethink, make some serious changes from the bottom up, uh, so they have to review pretty much everything because they're not doing well up to this point. Can you give us an idea of how the Commonwealth forces and their leaders dealt with improving the men's chances of success in this theater? I mean, it's it's a cracking story, I think. Um, you know, so vast numbers of Indian young Indian men are asked to fight um, alongside their the British and Australians in you know Malaya, Burma, mm -hmm. um, and. You know, it's it's not an impressive performance in the early years of the war. Um, you know, much bigger British and Commonwealth forces are routed by much smaller Japanese forces. Right. Um, and you know, generals are saying, you, you must fight for the empire, you must fight for freedom, you must fight for democracy. And I guess quite you know reasonably, a young Indian might say, well, what the world is that? <laughs> right. um, I'm not free. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is you know, I don't have control over my, my destiny or my country's destiny. Right. So there's this kind of disconnect again. And so... What they have to try and do is is somehow turn a fairly disenchanted citizen army into a into a professional one, with, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of really good training and kit. So, the, you know, quite a 
painful kind of lessons learned process is undertaken and right. um, those in command say okay right we're in trouble what are we going to do and the, the key thing really that they come up with is well we can't change the you know the situation you know we don't you know, it's not in our power to change the destiny of india i'm a general right. and <laughs> um, let's let's try and train these guys right so they they put in place this astonishing training process because in jungle warfare unlike the desert you can't, again, you can't really dominate the battlefield that easily with artillery. Um, jungle war- warfare requires infiltration, mm-hmm. small units working independently and aggressively to surround and penetrate enemy forces and make them surrender. So you have to devolve, because we're coming back to this doctrinal, devolve right. command and control to the front line rather than centralize command and control, which is what Montgomery wants to do. To do that, you need really well-trained young people, uh, you know, soldiers. So they, they create these vast new training organizations. And this happens in Australia as well, uh, and India. And, and these, these, you know, the Australians have had a bad time of it in the early years of the war too. And they create basically a professional army out of a, you know, a rabble. Wow. And we start to see some, some positive outcomes in kind of late 43, 1944. Um, Certainly, by this stage, um, you know the Japanese are looking for looking to kind of expand again, and you've probably come across Imphal and Kahima's kind of big, big kind of series of battles that takes place in 1944 in the in the Burmese jungle. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, um, you know, the the Indian Army, the British Indian Army, fights with real determination, real skill, and um, the training starts to play out positively on the battlefield, and it's a vast and dramatic defeat for the Japanese armies in Burma. So there's this really quite impressive turnaround in the space of a relatively short period of time. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds, Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Mm-hmm. And, and if I could drill down for a second, and again, I'm going off of memory from your book, what the commanders do is that they extend the training period, they specialize the training pe- training for warfare. So, and you're right, even though the generals can't say to an Indian soldier, you're now going to be free, what he can do is that he can say, I can give you the skills that to increase the chances that you an individual, you're going to survive this war. That's the best I can do for you. That's what they do. Mm-hmm. So not only are they more effective fighters, but their morale goes up because they actually think, hey, I might survive this. I might come out alive and victorious. And again, just focusing on the morale, how, mm-hmm. how could that not improve their chances overall? Well, they're quite clever. So they, they create these kind of Josh groups in inverted commas and army education, which also happens in the West too. Mm-hmm. So they kind of create a a space for the soldiers to talk about social change. We can we can talk about a better wor- world, although we can't actually necessarily right now right. make that happen. But then, we yes, we will turn you into professionals. We will teach you how to fight. We will send you into the jungle for two months and you will practice and you will practice and you will practice and you will practice again yeah. until – you can do what is necessary. And so confidence starts to improve and performance starts to improve. And then you get a little win and then a little win breeds another little win. Right. And you know, you know how it works. Um, and all of a sudden you have an army uh, or a series of armies that is capable of tackling uh, the Japanese in the jungle. 
And I just have to mention before we go on, this the training that you were speaking of was so intense. There were casualties. I mean, some of the soldiers were dying from live fire exercises, and so they made it hard as hell. But they were doing that so these men could have a chance of victory and surviving the battles against the Japanese. Quite right. It was you know very realistic, very tough. Um, and that really was the only way to, to solve. So the the solution kind of became, you know, training really is a central part of the book. And mm-hmm. if you think about it, I mean, step back, theoretically, you can have all the understanding in the world about how to fight or how to solve any problem. Right. But to make that understanding work, you have to practice and work out those little crink, you know, those little wrinkles, those things that go wrong. You've got to rep and rep again, and then and then you can convert that understanding into meaningful and effective practice. So training became the bridge between, you know, I think a set of armies and generals who had a decent idea about modern war, Mm -hmm. but were really struggling to convert it into victory on the battlefield. And training was the bridge that allowed them to do that. Yeah, I I grew up in a military family and something that was instilled in us in a very early age is the only difference between a civilian and a soldier is practice. And that's that's we just had that we had that drummed into us when it uh, to any facet of your life, you're going to get better at it if you practice. And that's what it comes down to. So now that they're improving the fighting capabilities and probably the equipment that these uh, Commonwealth troops are having, how does that manifest itself like in Burma and and, uh, Impala and Kohima? If you could mention some of that for us, please. Yeah, I mean, you're you're quite right. And we. We're not talking much about the United States here, but the right. kit, you know, vast quantities of the kit that is now available in these parts of the world is coming through lend lease mm-hmm. from the United States to Europe, to the Far East, to the jungles of Burma. So, I mean, that is another story for another day, but it is absolutely central also to um, the British and Commonwealth story right. uh, during the war. And so there's, 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 there's plenty of that in the book. Um, so, yeah, so they've managed to kind of come, you know, turn things around to a degree. But this process, you know, you can't go from zero to one to from, you know, loser to hero overnight. Right. So they, they, they kind of survive. They, they grind out this big victory at Imphal and Kahima, the Indian army. Uh, and once they've kind of repelled the, uh, the Japanese attack, they really struggle to kind of counterattack and make any progress. Mm-hmm. Because this kind of hybrid approach is now developed where, okay, they recognize the need for these fancy, mobile, aggressive operations, but they're still, you know, wedded to a degree to the, the old firepower heavy approaches um, of the uh, kind of early years in the war. So right. they, they don't quite get it. It takes them a while then to really to really get it right. And it's not until the kind of 1945 in Burma in operations capital and extended capital, which are these really very impressive um, operations to finish the war against the Japanese in Burma, that we really see the, the final part of this transformation where, you know, infantry and armor and um, work together with artillery and air power to produce dynamic, speedy operations where, you know, there's a lot of aggression and speed on show and they, mm-hmm. they and they absolutely tear through the Japanese army um, in central Burma and down towards Rangoon. Yeah, that was one of the parts of your books that I enjoyed when, when the Japanese, they have these massive advances, they have pincer attempts, they're trying to take these uh, very important locations. And you're right, in some ways, they're, the Australians and the, um, the Indians and everyone else, they are able to stand up to the Japanese and not only survive, but actually defeat them, halt them, push them back. And that just had to be a huge morale booster, because up until this, you know, almost this point, the Japanese are, in some ways, are seen as invincible as far as the individual warriors that they are. But with the right training and the equipment that's coming from the Americans, um, they're able to surpass them in fighting quality. And and you make the point in your book as well as that the Americans are like, well, let's just give a whole bunch of weapons to the Chinese. I mean, there are millions of them about... um, Let's just give, let's just arm them and, and let them harass the Japanese. And, and you know, the, the Commonwealth soldiers are like, no, no, we can do this. We've got this. We just need the training, the equipment, and the time. And they do prove themselves on that point. They just needed to become professional soldiers, and it worked out for them. I mean, I like you know, your emphasis on kind of the timing and um, the role of America in this. I mean, every day that goes by in the Second World War, Britain is in greater debt to, debt to the United States right. as it, you know, borrows money effectively to, you know, to pay for the war effort to, to, to put, you know, weapons on the battlefield. So there is this urgency, as you pointed out, this need for speed mm-hmm. to defeat the enemy quickly and be seen to be absolutely central to this story. 
And, you know, to a degree, the British and Commonwealth armies never quite get there. Or they only get there really too late. 1945 is is too late. They've right. basically handed handed the baton over to the United States. If 1939 Britain was the global superpower, and by 1945 it's the United States with you know Russia coming on fast. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, there's there are bigger issues at play here than just winning battles. There's geopolitics, um, Britain's place in the world, and so the the story of the army is in large measure the story of Britain's place in the world. Uh. So so let's let's uh, kind of jump into uh, to D Day, a, a very um, favorite topic of a lot of people who mm. listen to the show. So it's early 1943, and FDR and Churchill, along with their military advisors, decide that it's time finally, for, as far as Stalin is concerned, for the Second Front, the Great Crusade, as you say in your book. So can you describe for us the preparation of the British and Commonwealth forces uh, armies for D Day? Because like you like you said in the book. Military training and the manuals and the doctrines, that's been changing and evolving since 1939. Yes, I think, you know, early 1944, Montgomery, who is at this stage the the, the British hero of the war in many Mm -hmm. ways, um, arguably Britain's first celebrity general, is brought back to to Britain um, to oversee preparations for D-Day. And you know, he's been thinking hard about his experience in the Mediterranean, and he decides, right, we've got to, we've got to change up here. The His colossal cracks approach, which is how it's described in some of the literature, so his very methodical, firepower-heavy approach, he recognizes isn't going to get him where he needs to get to in, in Normandy. So he starts talking once again about going back to, you know, how the British Army had thought about fighting before the war, mobile, aggressive operations, much more devolved right. command and control. The problem is... As now, kind of, uh, as an army group commander, um, he leaves training to his subordinates, mm. and his subordinates are still wedded. You know, they've seen what has worked post 1942, this um, firepower heavy approach, and they're reluctant now to take too many risks. So, you know, when when the British army and the Canadian army, which is fights in a very similar way, lands in Normandy and D Day, um, while there's a recognition that there needs to be fast, aggressive activity, right. the troops are not trained to fight in that way. They're still trained to use artillery to subdue the enemy and then advance behind artillery until they get shot at, stop, dig in, <laughs> call for more artillery, You know, wait till it subdues the enemy, advance right. until they get shot at, dig in. So the, the speed that is necessary for really effective military operations is impossible because those who are asked – to do the job haven't been trained appropriately for the job mm. which is a bit of a harsh thing to say i mean th- they train in great great depth for the assault for the actual landing right and the british landings are extraordinarily successful what they don't focus on so much is what happens once you get off the beaches Right. I was going to mention that. So, And, and feel free to talk about yeah. you know, the approach the War Office takes to training the men. So, so they're going mm. to have to get ready for that. But there's also the question, again, that you state in your book of morale, because the, 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 I don't know if it's the War Office or whoever, but there's going to be – I don't know if it's a new approach, but when it comes to, to trying to discern if these men are up to scratch when it comes to actual fighting, they do go through a process and some of the men are weeded out. So the British seem to be getting better about, let's find out who's really capable of this and not just throw bodies in there that are going to freeze up and get shot within yeah. seconds. It's it's quite scientific, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite impressive in, in many, many ways. So officers are giving are given cards outlining the various skills of each individual in their unit, wow. um, intelligence levels, um, you know, level of training, fitness levels, um, educational um, attainment. And the psychiatrists come in and they talk to individuals and they say, okay, you're up for it, you're not, it's a bit rough. Um, so they weed out effectively those who they don't think can do the job. And you know that is a scientific um, way of approaching the problem. They put a huge emphasis again on mm-hmm. on morale and trying to g up the soldiers. It works a bit patchily. Um, it works perhaps more for the Canadians who seem to be absolutely on fire, gunning for um, D Day. Right. Um, but the, the, the dynamic on the home front in Canada is, is much more positive. Um, mm. uh, there, there's just a. That seems to be providing a, a much more um, 
I guess, fruitful environment for them to think about the, the potential sacrifice they're about to make. Right. British soldiers, on the other hand, are, you know, they're frustrated by all the Canadians and foreigners and Brit and Americans in, in the UK. Sure. Um, they're frustrated by a lack of promise in terms of a better world post the end of the war. Um, but, you know, what, what, what evidence is that? is there suggests that, you know, morale was, was pretty good on D-Day, certainly in the Canadian uh, sense. And they indeed do, of all the British and Commonwealth forces, they do the best on D-Day. They get furthest in land and would have taken their objectives, arguably, had they not been reined in um, by um, British commanders. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the morale issue, again, is, is central. If you, if you look at morale and the training issue, I think you can, try, you can really better understand why um, the British and Canadian forces didn't uh, attain their objectives on D-Day. Right. So like you said, morale has been addressed. Training has been focused on kind of gearing up for this different type of fighting. It's not the desert. It's not the mountains of Italy. So how do the British and the Canadians do on D-Day? Um, were, they, were they happy with their own performance? Do they feel like they let anybody down or were they just being realistic and, and doing the best they could with what they had? It's 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 a difficult old debate, mm -hmm. um, and people feel very passionate about um, how their tribe did in on this great day. Sure. Um, and so, I think one always has to be very sensitive in how 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 we approach it. And um, I think there's no doubt that the soldiers um, felt frustrated by what had happened. They were very proud, quite rightly, of um, storming the beaches. But the narrative that came out of their letters was that the Germans hadn't performed very effectively in their beach defences. And it was only once they got inland uh, that the really crack German um, troops started to um, materialise, which in large part is, is true. Yeah. And over the course of the Normandy campaign, the sense of frustration, why is it taking so long, starts to build up. And it is casualty intensive. It is as bad as anything really in the first world war in terms of daily casualties it's grinding it's tough the weather isn't great at times the flies are everywhere wow. um and you know the germans are fighting with quite significant determination hmm. eventually that starts to have an impact um on the troops so monty has tried initially right to return to this mobile aggressive approach mm -hmm. um he, he talks a lot about a lot about it before D-Day. When D-Day happens, it doesn't convert. His army doesn't perform as he wants, and so he gradually says, "Right, we can't be messing about here. We're going to go back to what we know has worked: this colossal cracks approach." And so the British forces start to grind out the Germans over time in Normandy, and, and a grinding war it is. And eventually, um, some British formations start to crack as well. So there are morale problems in the British Army in Operation Goodwood, if you can kind of picture that to the east of Caen um, in mid-July. Right. And then I think more interestingly, maybe for um, American listeners, the Canadians start to really struggle in August when they're trying to close the Falaise Gap. So the Americans break out in Operation Cobra to the west, mm -hmm. and this massive encirclement starts to develop. Um, I'm sure listeners can kind of visualize this in their heads. And the requirement is for the Canadians kind of to shut the trap from the north and close this, um, right. this growing encirclement. And they don't really get the job done. And there's you know, this consternation, you know, Bradley can't quite understand what's going on. Montgomery can't quite understand what's going on. Um, and when you start to look at some of the sickness rates, um, you start to look at battle exhaustion rates, the evidence starts to point towards just the Canadian army being utterly exhausted beyond belief. And they're struggling to keep going, which, you know, human beings have a, a limit. All human beings do. And the Canadians had been right at the fore um, for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And so... I think you know, the narrative that comes out of Normandy is you know, a lot of very determined uh, effort. It's a grind, but the type of dynamic operations that was really required to finish the Germans off were not present. And this, again, was part tactical and was part psychological, the, need, the, the struggling to get the soldiers to keep going in, in, pretty, in pretty tough conditions. Right. And of course, you, you can never forget the fact that you are talking about various groups, various nationalities fighting together. That's not always going to be the easiest thing in the world because you're going to, oh, those Canadians, they let us down, you know, so that that is right. That is, um, I guess, more than right to be able to finger point at other countries. But again, they do, you know get their act together. Everybody does their part. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it's literally adapt, adapt, adapt. And that seems to be 
something that almost happens daily for these for these troops. They have to, you know, whether it's the next hill, it's the next ridge, it's the next whatever, to adapt and to be able to go on. But you're right, there are hu- they are humans. They do get tired. But sometimes war calls for people to keep going, and, and they can't always meet that challenge. I mean, you're, and you're quite right. And I think we have to, you know, we have to try and understand and be sympathetic and not be pointing fingers for sure. Um, what is amazing with the Canadian story is, though, e- even though I think, you know, in August 1944, they really are struggling and yeah, that impacts on the ability to really finish the Germans off, um, perhaps for the whole war. They bounce back with remarkable speed and they get caught up in um, really important operations to free up Antwerp, which is you know major port in Europe mm-hmm. after D- after Normandy has been um, has been taken, and they perform now. Um, but a few months after Normandy, in the kind of um, late autumn winter of 1944, with astonishing determination and fight, so their morale bounces back. And, and the argument in the book, in part, is that um, you know there's an announcement about what's going to happen post-war in Canada. Mm-hmm. The Canadian veterans, Canadian soldiers, are going to get a huge bonus at the end of the war in the region of a, a thousand pounds. And, um, you know, by comparison, if you look at what the, the average, you know, British soldier thinks he's going to take home at this time is about 100 pounds. Wow. And so the Canadians saying, you know what, this may be pretty awful, but at least when I go home, I will be ready to go with a house. Uh, if I want to yeah. start a business, I'll have the cash. You know, there's some payback here. Mm-hmm. So this process of negotiation that's, you know, that's taken place all throughout the war is still going in 1944. And the, the Canadian state pays out big and the performance of the Canadian armies post Normandy is really very, very impressive. I'm glad you brought up the political social because because my next question is, okay, so the Western powers have landed in France. And as we all know, the Soviets are pushing hard on the Eastern Front. So this is the beginning of the end for, for Nazi Germany. Now, you state in your book that the men who were fighting for all of that they've been through, they never stop being concerned about their families back home, but also that through the struggles of the war and the question of why we are fighting in the first place besides survival seems to launch a political awakening, not only of the public, but also of the soldiers during the war. So could you share with us um, in various bits of the Commonwealth uh, countries, the changes Mm. that they went, uh, that they underwent at the end of the war? Yeah, one of the real finds um, while I was you know, going around the world and uh, researching this book was I first of all came across the statistics for the New Zealand Army mm-hmm. and Armed Forces in the 1943 New Zealand general election. So soldiers abroad fighting to defend democracy were also at times asked to partake in it. Right. And there's huge efforts made across the Commonwealth to allow armed force personnel to vote in elections during the war. So there's an election in Australia in 1940 and 43, Mm -hmm. in New Zealand and South Africa in 43, in Canada and in the United Kingdom in 1945. And you start piecing together all these statistics. Um, I was able to find the statistics for most of the other ones too. This really interesting dynamic um, started to develop, one that I found remarkable, that the closer to combat, or the closer to danger, maybe a better way of putting it, mm-hmm. soldiers came, the more left-leaning their vote became. Ah. So Canadian soldiers fighting in Northwest, you know, or serving in Northwest Europe in 1945 were more likely to vote for um, left-wing Canadian parties than, say, Canadian soldiers training in Canada or civilians in Canada. Mm-hmm. And the same goes across the board, you know, um, all, all these different... Um, armed forces. So the only way um, I could explain that was kind of looking at how shared danger awakened this kind of recognition in soldiers of how interconnected they are. Right. That, you know, if I'm lying in a slit hole or if I'm slit trench or if I'm getting bombarded, you suddenly recognize that your welfare depends on the guy or the person to your left or your right or back home building weapons or mm-hmm. driving a bus, that everybody needs everybody. It's a real team uh, process, you know, fighting a war. You can't hide the fact that your welfare is dependent on someone else. So the more obvious that became, i.e. the more in danger individuals wore, it appears the more likely they were to vote for left-leaning parties. In the case of the United Kingdom, that meant labor. All right. Now, and, and I'm going off memory here, but at the near the end of the book, you, you quote, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, you quote a British general I think he was about to become 
um, chief of staff. Um, but he, he's saying that, you know, we've really learned that um, this is a team effort and we are pulling together. And I can just imagine those soldiers who are in a different country fighting alongside other nationalities. How can you not but feel connected that there's there's much more going on than just you and your countrymen? Mm. And we see it across, I mean, almost all the combatants, there is a, there's kind of a state welfare moment post 1945 right. um you know partly to repay the sacrifice that has been made but also partly because of this kind of recognition that emerges from the war about how interconnected everybody is yeah so um so you you touched on this a minute ago but so you've got all these changes you've got all this political waking awakening happening in the various parts of the british empire so overall by the time the war is at an end how does all this um, new, I guess, new mm. thinking affect affect the British Empire. Okay, yeah, um, big question, eh? So, <laughs> um, so the so the British soldier, um, without doubt, when you look at the censorship summaries, British soldier votes for Labour in 1945. Mm. British soldiers, you know, his, his social network, you know, so the Twitter and Facebook of you know 1945, <laughs> the letters he's writing and he's influencing those around him. So when you start looking at the influence the soldier had, it's it. The conclusion I've come to is that the soldier's radicalization as a consequence of the war wow. impacts the outcome of the 1945 election in a very serious way. And Britain, you know, Britain changes changes course as a consequence of the Labour government. Um, Labour in um, in New Zealand genuinely only wins the 1943 election due to the soldier's vote. They were losing the election, mm. or effectively it would have been a, a tie, right. Um until the soldiers' vote returns from the Middle East, and then the Labour government survives. And so, you know, again, a big project of kind of social solidarity in, in New Zealand um, hinges on on the New Zealand soldier. Now, in the South African story is much less kind of benign and positive. Right. Um, you know, the South African state is a profoundly ra- racist state in the 1940s. Um, and, you know, black South Africans are not permitted to bear arms, broadly speaking, during the war. So... The dynamic of combat cohesion, this kind of shared danger, doesn't function for black South Africans. It does function for Afrikaners and English-speaking South Africans. Mm. And so this, this sense of kind of the, the, the kind of the previous antagonism that had animated um, the Afrikaner English-speaking relationship starts to dissipate as a consequence of their experience of the war. Mm. Um, there's a desire for shared South Africanism. The only way, however, for this... English-speaking uh, kind of um, connection, an English and Afrikaans-speaking connection to happen is to exclude um, the majority of those in South Africa from the social contract. And so, in large part, the war creates the conditions for apartheid. And when you again, when you look at the the vast kind of um, number of uh, censorship summaries, what the soldiers are saying, the war breeds uh, and racism rather than, unfortunately. Uh, dissipates it, and it, mm-hmm. the evidence seems to point very, very powerfully towards South African veterans voting for the nationalists, i.e., the institutionalisation of apartheid in 1948. So the dynamics of combat cohesion, you know, lead breed a sense of social cohesion that can have, you know, depending, I suppose, on your political perspective, positive things in terms of, um, you know, the, the left's moment in 1945, but could also breed. Um, very negative outcomes in terms of um, the rise of apartheid, the institutionalized apartheid in South Africa. Mm. Because one other um, dynamic, which is worth put, touching on really quickly, um, Ray, which is, sure. you know, so there's one other aspect to um, this dynamic that I'd like to touch on, which mm-hmm. is um, the partition of, of India right. um, in 1947. So the war, as we've discussed, leads to the, the breakaway of India from the British Empire um, and the creation of two new states, India and Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, there's a debate over where the, you know, the lines dividing these, these two new states should, should lie. And um, a, lot of, um, a lot of interested parties try to make um, this an easy decision by you know, using violence to, to take certain parts of the border area, and then there's vast population movements as the as the partition um, starts to take place, and mm-hmm. Muslims move from India into New Pakistan, and Hindus from um, the New Pakistan into into India. And what we find is 
um, soldiers or veterans play a really important role in this process. So all the organizational skills they've developed as a consequence of their time in the army mm-hmm. now helps them protect their communities if they're on, on the move. Um, it reduces, in many instances, the level of violence because, again, they're better able to to move communities away from wow. violence or protect wow. communities um, who are experiencing violence. So the role of the veteran, you know, lasts long after 1945. Um, in many ways, they create the conditions for the post-war world um, and, you know, play a really, I think, important role in politics and society, not just in winning battles. Mm-hmm. I mean, for for me personally, I and probably uh, most people who are not British, I cannot even imagine for someone say like Winston Churchill, um, the world that he was born into, his age, his place in society, um, to, to go from 1939 to 1945 to have his country change so much internally, and at the same time to have the British Empire. Um, disintegrate or whatever word you would like to use. I mean, it must have been such a, um, it, it must have just been absolutely staggering for him. How do you, how would someone deal with their world as they knew it and as they felt comfortable and actually were, was benefiting from it um, change so much so quickly? I, I just imagine it must have been very hard for, for some of the conservative elements in Britain at the time. I mean, you're quite right to point out the astonishing extent of the change. Um, and I guess we're we're, on, we're experiencing another period of a kind of lots of change. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what maybe ties the two together is you know the absolute centrality of of the ordinary person. Um, oh. That you know the end of the empire um, is is largely a consequence of British Empire's inability to mobilise its people in its defence. Um, so if you have a disenfranchised working class who mm-hmm. feel alienated from the state, they, they're not going to show up when it really matters, when the state asks them to do X or Y. Right. And, and to a degree, um, you could argue that Brexit and the rise of Trump are similar narratives, that you know, mm-hmm. those who were in power, the, you know, the, the, the privileged or whatever way you want to look at it, um, asked ordinary citizens to vote in certain ways, and they said no. So... Ordinary people matter, and I guess most of the time we can get by without taking much account of them, um, but eventually that will lead to revolt and revolution. So right. having a cohesive society um, is absolutely essential, whether it is in fighting wars or in geopolitics or in politics. I think that's one of the lessons I take away from it, at least. Yeah, I was going to say that is an excellent lesson for all the leaders out there, whether it's the leaders of a country or any kind of group, no matter how small, you know, how you treat your people um, will either benefit you or come back to bite you um, one day. It's just a matter of when. So. Dr. Fennell, thank you very much for your time and for this incredible book. And uh, you you probably just answered this, but if you have anything else you want to add. Now, my head is still reeling from reading your book and for all the information in it, in a good way, in a good way. But uh, I wanted to ask you, by the time you'd finished research, you're writing, you're sitting there, you're looking at your book, it's all done. What was one of the biggest takeaways for you? I was amazed at how many times I read the word fairness in the censorship summaries. Uh-huh. These people want I, mean, I think I think people can put up with an outcome that they, they don't want if they feel like it was fair. Right. The the process was fair. Um they want fairness when it comes to how they're treated by the army, they want fairness how they're treated by the state. So, I mean, that, I think, struck me, um, that, how important that is to people. And the, the other thing, just to come back to that point, mm-hmm. the centrality of the ordinary person, um, that the ordinary person has agency, power, can impact the history of great nations, great states, great peoples, great empires. And that I find uh, really positive and, and empowering. Well said. I, I completely agree with you. Um uh, and we see that all the time in sporting events. If you lose, you lose. But as long as you you feel like uh, everything was called fair, then people are willing to accept that. It's when things are not fair that people uh, have a way of reacting that can that can wreck everything. And I just have to say that by the time I finished reading your book, um, which I lost lots of hours of sleep, thank you very much. Uh, I, th- <laughs> I think I, as an American, I think I so much better understood the English, the Welsh, the Scots, the Irish, the Australians 
the Canadians, the Punjabis, uh, the Bengalis, the uh, the people of New Zealand, the Africans. It made a lot more sense to me. And I just wanted to thank you for that experience because it's not just a military book. It's not just military history. It's um, a comprehensive look, weaving it all together, which is perfect if you think, if you consider it for a moment, because that's how life actually operates. I am delighted that you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Right. So I certainly encourage everyone to check out this book, which is now available for pre-order, Fighting the People's War, the British and Commonwealth Armies, and the Second World War. Dr. Fennell, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. When you hire your local Serta Pro painters, you get the power of doing it right. Detailed project proposals, excellent customer service, and trusted professionals who get the job done on time and on budget. The power of experience. We're kings of the scaffolding and pros with the stucco. We've been there, done that. Get your project started at CertaPro.com and get the power of pro. Each CertaPro Painter's business is independently owned and operated.